Uh, hi everyone, my name is Bashida Tarakia and uh, I'm an architecture student at MIT. My background is in design and computation uh, and I'm very excited to be here to share my research on spatial cognition. Uh, this is roughly the structure of my uh, presentation. I'll start with motivation and certain frameworks that I, um, I researched on. Uh, I'll go through the applications and contributions. But the goal of my research is uh, to uh, open up the panel and like uh, address questions because a lot of stuff that I'll be addressing has already been spoken about by experts here. Um, let me start with the why. I think this is something we've been talking about in the last two days. Um, and it was something I asked myself as well. I was sitting around like neuroscientists and computer scientists, like why is this information important to my profession? And um, motivation was the study, which uh, I'm pretty much sure everyone here knows, but uh, this, was a, what, this is a study which goes on, um, which was conducted on uh, the, uh, the cab driver's brains. And it was interesting to notice that uh, how navigating through a space and while collecting information, uh, your brain actually changes. So what I was really interested in is understanding this process of what goes on inside our brain. How do we actually, um, how do we gather these information? Um, so the vision basically, uh, or rather the thesis of my uh, research is that if we, if we are to understand the implication of spaces uh, on human behavior and vice versa, then it is first imperative to understand spatial cognition and the computation inside the brain. Um, and I argue that the merits of this is not just in artificial intelligence, not in psychology and neuroscience, but also in architecture and planning. Uh, it could be used for design assessment, empowering designs, and like creating, de uh, creating design tools. Uh, human cognition, as we all know, is multimodal in nature. So as we navigate through spaces, we are, we are making models, we are collecting information, but we are also making like allo, uh, allocentric and egocentric models, which are spatial referential models. And um, I'm sure everyone here knows these terms, but just to give an idea, uh, allocentric models basically are independent of observer's location and orientation, whereas egocentric models are um, sensory, uh, are dependent on the sensory modalities like vision, position, etc. And essentially, this, the process of spatial cognition is a parallel computing that goes on between these two models, uh, which actually are, um, are computed in different parts of the brain. But what's uh, also interested in noticing that the accuracy of performance of these two models are very different. So the allocentric tasks are actually significantly lower in their accuracy compared to the egocentric tasks. But again, why is this relevant in architecture? Uh, architectural design and planning imposes significant emphasis on symmetry, axial orientation, sequential alignment, optimized space uh, placement. A good example of that is Salk Institute, of course. Um, uh, and, but I also argue that design is not a luxury, it's a responsibility, because what we create in our environment impacts our users at a very subconscious level. So understanding the neuroscience behind it is not just helpful, but it's actually necessary. So then what is it that we are trying to understand as designers um, from this science? Uh, let me start, so there are certain concepts that we want to explore. We want to try to understand the correlation between emotion, memory, and, the, and its association with spaces. Why is it that certain spaces are embedded so deeply in our memory and gain the feeling of timelessness, where some places tend to be forgotten irrespective of like, the frequent exposure to them? Uh, of course, like our cognitive scientists have like hypothesized that emotions are encoded in automatically and they are associated with environmental location. Uh, Nancy Canvisher's lab at MIT has discovered that um, there are uh, there are places uh, there are locations in our brain which respond to um, not just spatial environments but also to the images of uh, of scenes and spa and places. But as a designer, I argue that places are very different from spaces. Spaces actually have the, um, the physical attributes of location orientation, but spaces are more abstract. They have the feeling and emotions attached to it. So the question is, how do we start understanding this balance and how do we start bridging these gaps of uh, the concepts in, in, the, in the different domains? Um, Let's first start with how we are hardwired, and for that I actually like went on to the neuroscientific, uh, neuroscientific framework. Uh, of course, everyone here knows the basic of uh, how we are hardwired, like, uh, and anyone who's like um, explored navigation and spatial memory would uh, know the role of hippocampus. But I would like to point out that the presence of bidirectional pathways and the phenomena where uh, the replay of a certain subset of um, uh, cues can trigger an entire event 
uh, shows that spatial memory is not just navigational, but it's also temporal and emotional. Um, in terms, on a higher level, uh, hippocampus has like four kinds of cells. Uh, the play cells head direction cells. The play cells essentially respond to the location of the person, whereas uh, and they're invari they're variant invariant to the uh, orientation of the person. Uh, but the head directions are the ones that actually trigger uh, based on how you're orienting yourself in a certain space. Further on, there are grid and boundary cells, and these are basically our uh, apparatus to uh, sort of um, understand the space and as we move and as we navigate uh, to collect information. But again, this, this is the hardwiring, what goes on really in our mind. Um, so of course, there is like immense literature in psychology, and I would just like to point out certain concepts which I found were favorable and very important to architecture, and it's the understanding of spatial image. Uh, essentially, what spatial image, image is, uh, it's the symbolic representation of the space that you're moving in, moving in within. It's subjective to the observer, so which essentially means that if there are two people walking through the same space, their spatial image would be uh, very different from each other. And it's, it's again associated with a long-term memory of the observer. Uh, but it's also important to understand that spatial image is very different from the percept. Spatial image changes as we move through the uh, space. Um, and it gets updated, whereas percept is more uh, just a memory uh, that gets imprinted of the space. Uh, for example, like we all know the sunset that uh, we all witnessed yesterday, and that's pretty much the percept of the Salk Institute that we would take away with us. Um, again, there is this whole phenomena of spatial updating and the functional equivalence, which essentially means that as I move through a space, and, I, 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 and as I gather the information, uh, I start understanding the, um, the physical qualities of the different objects that are placed in the space, irrespective of my movement. <clears throat> so now that is what is going on in our mind, but then exactly how are we, how do we bring models, how do we make models of this? Uh, and uh, uh, while there was a lot of talk um, about architecture and neuroscience, I believe there was a little talk in, in the computational framework. So, um, I would just like to go uh, very briefly over the different uh, frameworks that are available, and obviously there is a lot of work that's done in artificial intelligence. Uh, it's the it's building of like different models of human thinking. Uh, there are three kinds of um, school of thoughts, I would say. One is uh, the symbolic spatial memory models, which is based on the assumption that uh, cognition consists of uh, discrete mental states, and that we think symbolically, and then we associate with memory and spaces symbolically. There is also another framework, which is the neural network and uh, based spatially me uh, spatial memory models, uh, which is in contrast to the uh, symbolic thinking, but it mainly uh, assumes that the computation inside our brain is based on the numeric values and it can be computed and we could actually build models of, of human thinking. Uh, the third, uh, uh, the third uh, framework is uh, based on more of the spatial memory and cognitive architecture. And it's sort of like a hybrid between um, uh, between symbolic thinking and the neural thinking, and it talks about the high-level intelligence and what really goes on um, as we as we navigate through spaces, as we collect information. What is it that we really um, um, perceive, and how do we use different parameters like uh, memory, attention, and spatial interpretation? So again, we have all these different frameworks, but how do we actually inform that uh, to our design? And that was something which I was really interested in. Um, I would not go into the details because I'm sure everyone here has like so many thoughts and ideas about it and I would like to hear more of that. Uh, but just a brief, uh, like there are different applications in design. Um, like we just saw there was like a lot of work being done in responsive design. Uh, there is so much work being done into cognitive robotics, uh, into human inter uh, interaction interfaces and into even in the simulation of uh, spatial experiences. Uh, and what I want to argue is that in addition to designing physical environments, architects and designers have the opportunity and the responsibility of shaping our digital world, our virtual world, and our non-physical surroundings. Uh, but what I'm mo even more interested in is how can we use these tools to teach design? Um, can, we make, um, can we make models or tools for uh, qualitative and quantitative assessment of designs? Um, can we can we start using these tools to uh, teach design to the non-designers who do not speak the same vocabulary? And can this creative tool be uh, for neuroscience? Uh, can this be a tool for creative, um, creative neuroscience-based experiential design? Can this be a start of a new um, new form of architecture? 
Um, Herbert Simon actually, uh, in his book of, um, uh, it says, The Science of Artificial, uh, he says that uh, architecture is an, is an art of problem solving. But I argue that architecture is actually a process of designing in the mind, making with our hands, and experiencing through our sight, touch, smell, and other cognitive apparatus. And learning how we employ our cognitive apparatus can help us design experiences uh, that transcend from our minds into both physical and virtual worlds. So in conclusion, I have emphasized the significance of understanding neuroscience for designers, which everyone here obviously um, is convinced about. Uh, I have explained the certain scientific concepts of different domains and how we have a similar vocabulary, but we have different interpretations. Uh, I have investigated the different frameworks for sp spatial cognition and from neuroscience pr perspective, psychology and cognitive computer science. And I suggested applications in design technology. But what I'm more interested in is, um, is asking these questions. First, I want to ask that, are we asking the right questions? How can we actually have interdisciplinary dialogue without any common terminology established yet? Uh, how can we go from interdisciplinary to multidisciplinary? And how can we have input from cognitive science, computer science, anthropology, uh, social science, and uh, other, uh, other fields? And how can we avoid, this is something that I wanna be, I'm, I'm personally very cautious about, is how can we avoid the overuse and incorrect abuse of scientific data? Uh, again, something that we all need to be, I think, very uh, cautious about is how can we avoid the curse of knowledge? We are all these experts in our different fields, but we, are, we also need to be aware of uh, the fact that we are designing for the users and we do not use them just as data, but we also involve them in the design process. Um, and if we are all tri striving to understand human behavior and intelligence, then what tools can we design to understand it better? And I would just like to uh, end with this thing that architects are, um, at the end, spatial storytellers. And all we are striving to understand is how can we tell our story differently? Thank you. Thank you very much.